should have them. All right. Well, first off, thanks for having me, Daryl. You know, audio guy is kind of under the radar most of the time. So I've been at EA now for nine and a half years. I've done 38 AAA title games for EA. Um, because of being in audio, you don't really sit on a game team like every other artist or SE in the company. You're sitting on multiple franchises per year. So a typical year might be anywhere from two to six games that we're working on at one time. Uh, through our history there at Tebron, we've also branched out to other studios and worked on other titles. They're not even sports related or they're sharing a common tech or something like that. Um, that's one very cool thing about working in audio is the diversification of projects. Because of this, I was able to get into stuff like we did a, a bunch of sound design on uh, Warhammer Online, which is definitely not sports related. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, through uh, common technology, I was working on NASCAR for probably five or six years. Uh, the Need for Speed team, also making a car game. Uh, we were sharing a lot of like how to build these cars up in the virtual world, um, you know, practical data, recording techniques, it goes on and on. So the benefit is I was able to get exposure to their world, work on their projects, and vice versa. So um, my background, actually, uh, I was always like an electronic uh, instrument fan, samplers, synthesizers, all that kind of stuff. Um, that got me into sound design really early. Uh, beyond that, did a lot of post-production work. Um, worked in Colorado, uh, doing various you know television shows, movie trailers, a lot of independent film. Um, later went into uh, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, which is they did a bunch of like artistic documentary kind of work. Um, Got to do a lot of large-scale recordings, choirs, orchestras, that kind of stuff. Um, but one thing in the post world, and I'm sure anybody here who's ever been through a post, anything, <laughs> tons of dialogue cleanup work. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like, uh, can't deal with it. Um, you know, because as a, as a sound designer, you want to create cool sounds, you want to create those sound tapes and whatnot. Um, I wound up on a project that took me out to Skywalker Sound. <laughs> and I was like, this is great, you know, and I got to sit down with uh, Laura Hirschberg. And uh, we were talking about big league projects, right? They were talking about you know stuff that they had done, like they had come off Titanic and all that other stuff. Uh, and I was saying, so, you know, this must be it. And it's like you know, climbing the Mount Everest. And she goes, yeah, it wasn't for all the dialogue cleanup. You know? <laughs> and I was like, ah, it's like climbing the Mount Everest and finding a seven living up there. You know? <laughs> okay, back down. And I decided to change my industry, so I jumped into video games back in the era of the uh, PS2 and the original Xbox. Then I came into a completely different set of problems. Um, so I was used to large format consoles, big Pro Tools sessions, all those kinds of things. And, uh, and I, you know, had listened to games and I'm like, you know, they can do so much more with these games. They can make them sound so much better than they do. Um, I, what was the deal with that? Maybe they just, you know, didn't have a lot of audio guys that were savvy in it or whatnot. When I actually arrived, I found out what the deal was, is that you were trying to fit all of your audio experience into two megs of RAM. So that was the issue, right? <laughs> so out the window goes like pretty much everything I knew about post-production and all that. Uh, and then back into my window is um, information on like how to program a sampler. Yeah, which back in the day was like an IS-1000. <laughs> uh, and that's where you started your prototyping. If it could work well in that environment in a two meg window, you were going to be successful in putting together a sound for a video game. So I uh, changed my mentality, got into a lot of um, third party tools like Reactor. I don't know if there's any Reactor fans here. Which later I learned you could pretty much do anything you wanted to in audio. As a matter of fact, in NASCAR, last year I did like 2007, 2008, the entire game I did in Reactor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sound design, engine design, how it worked through, uh, you know, all kinds of modes. It's a fantastic tool. I'll actually go into that a little bit. So, that, later you're welcome to ask me any questions about any of that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start the formal presentation here. And this is um, how to avoid top 10 mistakes. Audio. So I'll get this off for you. about a quarter 
huge score. So if you look at games on Metacritic, you'll find that the majority that are getting greater than 75 ratings also have significantly higher ratings in sound. This is no different than the film industry where many of the films that win Best Picture have also won or been nominated for Best Sound or Best Musical Score. I think most producers and designers don't really get into audio because they don't completely understand it. Audio is kind of the invisible feature in games. Audio can do many things in a game. It can represent the emotion of the game. It can also represent the visceral experience of the game. You get a sense of depth and scale and mass. Your users appreciate it. Your critics appreciate it. It's a very cost-efficient feature to upgrade to your game. Audio is that polishing touch. It's something that so many game companies get wrong. And if you get it right, it can be the thing that pushes you up into that 10% of critically acclaimed games right where you belong. Alright, so that was the intro. Um, so, the number nine mistake. <laughs> Audio is a one person job. Uh, used to be, back in the day of like a card, <laughs> it was uh, the lead programmer. And he would be the guy that converts whatever that we're trying to make into that set of code that will run. And all you were doing was basically manipulating kind of like analog technology. And that's where you got all the loops and weeps. Um, so that person would do the graphic presentation, the runtime presentation, and the audio presentation himself. Later on, uh, as game consoles started getting into the PS1 era, uh, going into the PS2 era, they, you know, the sound. Uh, abilities of the consoles increased significantly. Now you could actually load in a PCM sample in some kind of compression. Um, so the sounds were crude, but they were more realistic than the analog tones that we heard, the simple tones that we heard earlier in the gaming industry. So um, then there was the aspect of, yeah, well, we still have the guys that can create it, we just don't know where to get the source. So there was always the, well, we can buy some CD libraries, but then it's like they don't know anything about editing, they don't know anything about how to master a sound or whatnot. So then uh, sound designers in a traditional fashion entered the industry. They start you know, recording dialogue, they start putting in actual music. Uh, you can stream at that point, um, you know, and some sound effects. But at that point, what was going on, it was a bunch of guys creating WAV files, most of them outsourced sending it to the programming staff. The programming staff would take those files, hook it up somehow in game, usually direct, you know, C plus or C sharp, C plus plus, uh, and just trigger it manually. Because of that, you found game experiences were <coughs> incredibly redundant, so you kept hearing the same lines of dialogue, the same sounds, repeating over and over and over again. And so it was more realistic, but it was also more <laughs> really annoying, right? So as consoles started to evolve and we understood like the PS2 and the Xbox better, sound designers started going out and just you know, trying different things where they were manipulating the runtime engine. And then all of a sudden you're hearing games like Halo and stuff coming out, which they're you know, suddenly streaming in multiple channels of audio. They're doing surround sound. Um, they're doing, you know, every time you trigger an action, you're hearing different results. Um, so it became a more complex job at that point and at the industry at this point now we are in you know our latest generation of technology. Uh, this would be like the 360 the S3 currently. Um, and here's the breakdown. So you have a dialogue designer. You have a, you know your traditional sound designer. So I'll just kind of break through all these: music composer, technical audio artist, and a, you know, a software engineer dedicated to audio. Going off here, so a little breakdown of what these people do. Dialogue designer, um, identify script issues. What's the story we're trying to tell? Um, he directs the voice talent <laughs> after the script is usually commissioned to be written. Um, the voice talent, you know, it's the performance. And this is also in the video game industry where we're having a lot of problems. You get a Brad Nessler or any of those guys. Um, you know, major sports announcers are coming in. They're used to looking at the events unfolding on the field and just going, this is what I'm seeing. This is what's happened and this is why it's impressive because this guy's, you know, a hot shot or whatever. 
in this world, the sentences are built on the fly in response to game commands. So like Madden, for instance, will have something like 59,000 lines of dialogue. None of those are a complete thought. Okay. They're all like, and it's so-and-so, and it's so-and-so, number da-da-da, team da-da-da, and here's the play that they're doing, and you know, and those things will have to be put together on the fly. <laughs> so the dialogue designer, his, his tough part of his job is to get a voice down to understand that. And that's where, if you've ever heard sports games come out, and you've heard the, this announcer in real life, and he sounds energized, and he sounds like he knows exactly what he's talking about, and then you hear him in the game, and he seems kind of flat. It's that that he's going through. He's you know, reading a script that's like the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and he's trying to put emotion into partial sentences. And you can't put too much emotion into it because it's being stitched on the fly. So you want Johnson is going down the field for, you know, <laughs> those are common issues that we face, right? Um, in short, the story is acted, not just read. Um, this is a thing that I'll be talking about a little bit later. But uh, there's a huge difference between a voice actor and a, an actual actor. You know, a voice actor will sell you a car at, you know, Bill Ray Nissan, right? On the television. Um, an actual actor can put emotion into that character. So um, I think somebody who would be awesome to get down here is like Ellen Clinton, who I met on Siege. And she's the voice of Gladys, if, uh, if you've ever played Portal. Uh, both her and her husband gave the most amazing speech about how to be a professional voice actor. And uh, I was like, wow, <laughs> I wish I had a project for you. That would be great. Um, but that's a really an important thing to get that emotion out of. After currently, like Friday, next Friday, <laughs> next Friday, I'm flying to Los Angeles. I'm doing this for real. I have 10 people, 10 actors on a sound stage. We're shooting it like a movie for NBA for current game. Uh, and uh, we'll be micing them up, you know, boom pole, shotgun, the whole thing, and tracking them around and having them act scenes that don't even exist. They're all animations. So. Uh, all right, uh, it takes detailed notes for the editors. Um, you know, obviously these are the takes you want to use. This is the takes I think would work best in a stitch scenario. Makes revisions to recorded lines if needed. Okay, that sounds way too close. We're going to bring in the talent again to you know, redo that. Uh, and then there are the actual guys that write the uh, scripting logic. Um, and there's various tools that do this. I know if you want to get a hold of one, Audio Kinetic offers wise. You can just uh, download it. Uh, it'll do some basic scripting for dialogue. Um, and that way you can have some kind of logic going on, or at least just try out what that's about. Uh, limits redundancy and dialogue at runtime. Nothing worse than, like, you heard this great line the first time you play the game, and the 500th time you played the game, you're like, if I hear that story one more time, you know, <laughs> you the dialogue, right? So. Next person, sound designer. Um, this person here, Foley artist, location sound recordist, creates the sound palette for the game. What are we trying to go after? What kind of game are we uh, going after here? Uh, master of the sound manipulation tools, uh, digital audio workstations, BSD device, et cetera. This is a big question they get a lot right about here is what do you use? What's like the number one tool that you use? That answer will be completely different from sound designer to sound designer. Um, there are definitely the traditionalists, the pro tools, uh, the window, um, there's guys doing stuff in sonar. Um, if there was one tool that everybody seems to be using, it's SoundForge. Because remember, we're not making these massive sound projects, we're making little tiny sounds. So after you've created your comp and whatever DAW your choice, <laughs> you create your soundscape and pro tools with all of its layers, and then you're cutting it up into those tiny little samples. It usually winds up in some simple application, Peak, uh, SoundForge, et cetera. Um, then there's tools that we use for processing those sounds to be you know, coherent across the, uh, the game experience, mastering tools. Um, again, a variety of stuff, maybe Ozone, something like that, one of those mastering ones. Uh, and then prototyping it, which I'll show you. I do a lot of Reactor, Maximus P fans. A lot of uh, Maximus P designs actually can be directly integrated into a game. There's a couple engines that you can just drop it in and let it run. Very, very cool. 
So that's a sound designer's job. Um, create a point of contact for audio pre-visualization. That's a game team director coming down and saying, all right, new mode of the game, we want it to do this. How would you make that happen? Uh, often used as an audio post engineer for marketing and in-game video happens, right? You did all this sound design, you got this, you know, gigs and gigs of sounds on your hard drive. Can you put together some marketing spot for us or whatever? We're starting to finally break away from this at our studio, where we actually have a dedicated audio post engineer for those type of things. It, it is kind of a different discipline than game audio in general. Music composers, they want to get all the emails now. <laughs> Create music to fit the style of game. Uh, works closely with uh, game team producers to create the emotion of the game. This is the one that everybody goes, ah. Longer in in house position. Uh, music composition in general has been shut down inside of uh, at least the EA. Uh, and one of the big reasons is because of the flood of composers in the market. Uh, certainly, you know, 10 years ago, to have an incredible game score, maybe somewhat symphonic or whatnot, that was something that cost $100,000, right? And you needed some very specialized people to pull that off. Nowadays, you know, five grand. <laughs> you can get your nice computer, you get a copy of uh, Symphobia, you got, uh, you know, whatever music software problem, problem you have or program you have. Uh, you can create some really impressive sounding stuff. There's a flood of composers coming out, and they're not just like kind of good, they're like really good. You know, I get demo reels all the time, every week from people all over the world that I listen to, and I'm like, man, if I was one tenth that composer, you know? Um, and because of that, there, it's just, there's like so many things that we require. And that doesn't mean we never uh, you know, compose some music. Occasionally, things that we compose are like, you have a little, you know, 10, 20 second, presentation thing that happens in the game, you just need a little filler. So those are the kinds of things we reverted to. Um, I think the last major composition I did was about two years ago. We did a couple tracks for Tiger Woods 11, just because their schedule was very, very tight. Um, technical audio artists, uh, this is kind of what they regard me as. They're often a sound designer, uh, or have that background responsible for mixing, speech, music, and sound effects. That's not like in an external application, that's actually on whatever console we're working on. So on the, uh, for instance, 360, I have a mixing utility that syncs with the console and it throws up what kind of looks like a Mackie mixer. <laughs> uh, and it allows me to dial in you know, all the different groups of sounds and kind of what I want. It's a very crude um, EQ system. It has an effect setting that you can send to one internal convolution reverb. Um, and then you can save it, whatever snapshots um, you want. And the game triggers basically if there's a certain event that unfolds in the game, it can trigger a snapshot the game can change its mix. Kind of like a live production drum guy. Okay. Yeah. Is, it a, is it a proprietary tool or is it licensed? It currently is a proprietary tool and within EA there's probably like three or four of them. So um, they change a little bit. But the fundamental is the same. Uh, it uh, will essentially just kind of query the sound system and say, well, what are you doing as far as your levels? The other thing that, to keep in mind is how audio in a game works. It's not linear. So one of the things that, especially when you're talking about volume attenuation, is you're in 3D positional space. So on top of your virtual game camera is a virtual microphone. And we have it now where if that camera gets close enough to whatever, an emitter or a shader that has been tagged with audio, it's going to be perceived as louder. Uh, it'll also change its position in surround space. So if that chair is the emitter of the camera, I walk up, as I get this close, it's gonna unfold in surround sound. If I walk off back here to the side, it's going to be monitored <coughs> in that speaker. So um, when you're mixing a game, it's not just like you set the mix, you listen to it, yeah, that sounds great. No, it's you set the mix, you play the game for several hours <laughs> to try out the different scenarios. And yeah, all right, sometimes that works. And if not, you know, you'll get experiences like, where is those fireworks sounds coming from? Or, you know, and you realize that you mix them way too hot. And it gets into a certain mode or it cuts to a certain camera. And post it, so. uh, responsible for planning audio memory application. Okay, the memory situation, we're definitely past the uh, two meg point. 
Uh, but again, if you ever want to do a test of like, you know, game design for a console, take uh, whatever sampler of your choice. Now you have wonderful options, you know, a contact or something like that. Give yourself a budget of about 13 megs and try to build your entire soundscape with that. Um, and have streaming, you can do like eight channels. <coughs> so, better than the PS2 and the Xbox, but you know, certainly not quite hit the film industry yet. So. All right, uh, designs audio feature functionality. Um, how does it work, how does it run? Sets up snapshots for the scenarios. And there's also the bridge between a software engineer and the audio department. Okay, so my knowledge level is here. I have a couple guys that are software engineers at EA that are like somewhere up around the moon, I think. Um, and when you're trying to talk to them about artistic design of audio, the, really the best way you can do it is show them a prototype, show them a Maximus P project, show them a reactor project, because they're looking at how is it functioning, you know, versus a verbal thing or a written thing. Um, other things that help them if you do prototypes in you know, like Vegas or something visual where they can see it, it's a tangible thing, okay, what's your result? It's just trying to get louder, it's just trying to loop those kinds of things. Um, that is a major help for them. Uh, and then they actually, if it's something that your current system, whether you're using uh, you know, Unreal or something like that, cannot do, they can possibly do in code. All right, so audio software engineer, they're the master of the runtime system, well versed in programming languages. If you're seeing calls from the audio system, okay, can you make it, you know, can there be an event for, you know, running on the field, we want to get different velocities so it could run faster. You know, we switch to this running set of football, uh, foot samples versus walking samples. Yeah, sure, you know, they look at those kinds of logics in the physics engine. Uh, optimizes audio performance, stuff like, uh, you might have a bunch of streams, but they're on layer two of the disc as it streams around and you're getting latency, you know, like, oh man, you know, Sounded weird, it's off time. Could be just where its position is and how fast the disk is accessing it. Uh, balances memory allocations, uh, <laughs> which is always fun. It's usually the team going, yeah, we need another two megs from audio. <laughs> <laughs> Works closely with sound designers for debug, you know, trying to uh, troubleshoot problems. I think audio is easy to integrate. This is another one that gets teams in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, they're just saying, you know, this, this, it's just sound, right? You know, it couldn't be that bad. We're going to schedule that later, or, you know, they just don't put a lot of emphasis on it. Right? Uh, so, the effect here, audio can be very complex to integrate, right? Anybody here who's ever tried to do a, a game audio project realizes that's not something to do in a week. Uh, you definitely need a dedicated audio runtime system, as why, such as Wise or Fmod. This becomes exponential as you get into a larger game project. You know, when you're talking about multiple levels, modes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if the game team is depending on the audio I see to hook up all that work, that guy is going to be able to live in there. So <laughs> anything that they can do to just provide you triggers, and you can provide all that information in one of these runtime solutions, can make your life way easier. Uh, okay, next. Assign at least one full-time software engineer to assist the audio team for optimal results. You think that's a gimme? It doesn't always happen that way. Um, some games are really good at it, like our Need for Speed franchise has like several or four different guys working on audio integration, and that's working with the artists and trying to get things integrated. But, um, right. So. Uh, Allocate proper QA group to audio. So these are people listening on proper 5.1 sound systems, and you've educated them with their listening for. A lot of times they just assume, well, those are your audio bugs. Well, the audio bug might not be some like huge popping noise or big dropout. It might just be line of dialogue played in the wrong scenario, or you know the pan mixes backwards or something like that. And if they don't know what they're listening for, then they're listening. Listen to your game often on good quality equipment. This one, another one you think is a give me, but when you have a game team, there's a ton of producers and programmers and whatnot. They're up there, they're listening on these little, like, Dell $25 speakers. And they're like, you know, that's just not, that's not sounding huge, you know? Well, your speaker doesn't sound huge. You know, put on some headphones or come down and, and check it out on, on proper equipment. Uh, and that changes their opinion, too, which is critical because a lot of times they'll make major audio decisions based on what they're hearing from their reference. All right, so power of the prototype. I'm going to go into Reactor here a little bit here. 
So this is how uh, Superman sound design started about two and a half years ago, and that is with the interactive prototype. Uh, what you're seeing here is, uh, this is a product called uh, Reactor. It's made by Native Instruments. Um, it has tons of MIDI input. You can build anything out of this, synthesizer, samplers, uh, effects processors, whatever. But what we built out of it was uh, the original engine for Superman. And then what this specifically is, is this flight engine. So during the actual prototype, we used a uh, Xbox 360 USB controller with a uh, MIDI interface inside the computer to give us this uh, interactive prototype uh, control. So what I've done here is just to recreate that, we assign the flight uh, sounds to the uh, joystick of the tripod. but they want to see it kind of up front. So um, to be well versed in either Max or Reactor, that's going to be a huge win for you in the game industry because it'll show your prototyping abilities. It also can influence the direction of the game. They go, we were thinking of going that way, but it didn't really sound right. You know, it wasn't really the field that we're after. Let's go a different direction. Here in you know, quarter one, yeah, we can, we can switch everything about the design in a week or two weeks. And you know you're still months ahead of it. <laughs> so again, that's why audio is uh, definitely an upfront task. Other considerations uh, to get rolling quickly: source acquisition. That means actually going out and recording. If you need something specific, guns, cars, crowds, whatever you need to make your game sound appropriate. Uh, random streaming allocations. You can pre-allocate. Well, I know exactly how much RAM we're going to need to run our project. Um, you have, uh, you know, the voiceover talent ability. The, if you are in a looking for local talent, that's usually not a problem. If you're trying to book professional talent, uh, you know, trying to get Aaron Andrews in or something like that, good luck. It's going to take a while because you've got this huge schedule though, uh, to deal with. Uh, editing time for speech. This is another one that bites a lot of teams, and that is usually you know we recorded 20 days of dialogue, and that needs to be in the game in a week or something like that. <laughs> okay, I'll start hiring that army now. <laughs> uh, sound design for the menu systems, UI. This is one that bites teams quite often, mostly because um, the art dependency there. Like the final menu system or whatnot usually isn't done until like the last quarter of the game. Uh, and you say, what are all the sounds of that? And you have to have the feel and the appropriate sound to match the look. Um, so you're so art dependent that that comes in very, very late. If you can get them rolling on that quickly, you can get a curve. Uh, audio post for a game in videos, uh, test and tune time, audio streaming and allocation, uh, loading optimizations, uh, licensing and clearance, if you're doing any kind of, um, especially like sports games, man. Uh, NFL films, for instance, anything that we use that actually came from an NFL film source, they have to clear it. They have to clear your scripts. They have to clear everything that, you know, the actors actually said. And that process can take a while. So, music contracts, especially with name artists, those can take a very long time. 
and then you have all your debug time. Uh, and that kind of ties into this one, uh, not only in like the time allocations, but also this is an eye opener as far as how the game industry actually works. From an audio standpoint, just outsourcing. A lot of teams, you know, are going that route. We can just hire in people. They can uh, provide us a bunch of source, and we can be off to the races. Uh, this is how it works: the cycle of audio development. That's music in its entirety. You know, getting the compositions and getting it all edited. Uh, this is sound design in its entirety, 20% of our scheduled time. Uh, that's going to get the source, editing it up, getting the prototypes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is speech design. That's you know, recording the talent, starting to um, you know, edit it all up, get it mastered, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the one that puts everybody on the side of the face. <laughs> that's the time that it takes to integrate all the other parts of that. And that's using you know a variety of tools. You're also you know fighting like the game is ever changing as you're building it. You know graphics demands go up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you're up against this huge wall. The crazy part of this, then if everybody you know if you ever wondered why is it that you hear about game teams when they go into alpha, people are like living at the company for you know two or three months and crazy hours. That sixty percent normally happens in alpha which is the last six weeks of the video game cycle. And so, you know, you try to get as much into that curve as you can earlier into the design, but it really depends on your dependency. Is the game ready to run audio correctly? Um, do they have integration time? Is there software engineer available? Do they have the RAM available? Um, so those are the things that are really, really tricky. And if you outsource it and you're a team that really doesn't know what that curve looks like, it gets very hairy at the end of it. So, large percentages of audio happening in the alpha, teams underestimate the designer and engineer dependency, it's just trading ideas. Audio is very art and animation dependent. Uh, memory allocations can change. Most teams uh, lack proper audio monitoring, which we talked about earlier. Uh, QA doesn't always know what to listen for. Outsourcers rarely commit to one logic at a time. So if you, you know, are like, well, we're having an editor. Some artists or composer dealing with it, uh, they might be doing three or four other games at the same time. So that's the, uh, the relationship. Number five, this actually hits you more on the uh, <laughs> uh, review side. Using video game to sound with the shade. <coughs> and what's great is because so many producers and sound artists, they work in a vacuum. They think, you know, this is the only game that's ever been made. Uh, some of these are the ones that crack me up the most. This one. Why do other galaxies? But the headset still sounds like that. A 1976 CD radio. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like every game has that can, you know, we're going out with that. Uh, this is, as, you know, me speaking out to a group of artists. You know, start thinking of what would you do in that scenario? You know, you're handed whatever, the Mass Effect franchise or something. How would you make it feel high tech? You know, how would you change the sound from the cliche? You know, those are the things that kind of, you know, you want your audience to accept what you're trying to do, but you also want to present it in a different way. Uh, this one. <laughs> Producers always give me a big moment. Oh, let's add a heartbeat at that. You know, the, um, which is funny because every producer has ever said that to me. It's kind of felt like they were the first ones that ever come up with that. You know, and like, well, yeah, play all the games that have that in there. Yeah. So again, as artists, even if you get that advice, you're like, okay, we'll go with something like that, and you try to come up with your own version of that, your own take of that. That's your own signature. <coughs> Matrix swoosh for slow mo. Um, this is like what's trending in Hollywood kind of uh, request from a producer or whatnot. Um, yeah, in this movie they have this really cool sound, and you can base something off of that. But again, try to make it unique and something that will fit into the genre of game that you're working. Uh, click and beep are the only two desirable sounds for the UI. Um, this one, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time dealing with UI, and mostly I. Uh, wind up talking a lot with the art directors and just say, you know, what is the kind of presentation are you, you putting up there? What kind of elements uh, are the screens made of, like glass slides, or are they doing some kind of like energy field or metal or whatever, and you base your sound palette on that. 
And uh, what happens is once you get that done, when you're playing it, it just feels right because it looks correct. You know? It's like they expect they see a glass thing moving around, they hear the sounds of glass or something you know, skating around. They're like, okay, it seems appropriate, and they accept it easier. It's out of place. That's the kind of sound that you go, well, something's up with the audio sound. Every action in sports needs a line that's to explain it as if you could actually, uh, you could not see it. This is something that we fight with all the time in a sports game. Uh, you know, we used to have like play by play that would literally call it as if you were hearing it on a radio and you're not actually seeing it. He's at the 10, he's at the 20, you're like, dude, he's already past the 20, he's already sees at the 10, um, and you're saying it every single play. And that's not giving me any information. Now we're starting to do different scripts where, you know, maybe the first initial plays will say something of that nature. But later in the game, you know, he's done this run several times, and he usually gets stopped here by this, or, you know, they're running this pattern again, and that pulls the, the player away from, uh, okay, I'm just doing a game, but that actually the game is responding to their, their actions and telling them different information, so maybe they can actually play better. Um, so this is where you might not just tie lines of speech to yard markers, you might tie lines of speech to AI, right? The AI is swinging left. Oh, you know what? He ran this play last time. They're coming at him from the left now because, you know. And that way the player is like, whoa, that's creepy, you know? <laughs> but it also adds to the realism. Uh, one huge crowd for hours on end. Uh, just on uh, our current Institute project, we recorded 38 games in surround sound in their entirety to build various crowd sets because a crowd in a uh, sports environment is a living thing. It's thousands and thousands of people, and uh, they are ever-changing. If the game's a blowout, half of them go home. They're like, not interested, the crowd sound changes. If they're sitting down, the crowd sound changes. If it's a really close game and it's like the end of you know uh, a huge battle, the crowd is going ballistic, it changes. So there's tons and tons of source that you need, not just that one droning crowd which will be easily be perceived as white one. Loading a gun is the loudest firing one. <laughs> you get a whole thing on that. Uh, if it's magic, it's gotta have a shing or a beltry sound. This is again asking artists, okay, you're handed, you know, World of Warcraft, or you're handed uh, Dragon Age or something like that. How would you change up spell sounds to add your own twist and not stick with a cliche? It's a very challenging, you know. A thing to do, but it also will add the signature to your game that we're not just like every other title out there. And there's a lot of competing titles. You know, EA, EA actually has another title coming out here. Um, I'm trying to think, it's the one developed by uh, uh, 38 Studios. We're calling it Copernicus, or have been for the past couple of years. It's going to actually change. Um, it's up online, so I can talk about it publicly. <laughs> the trailers are here. Anyway. Uh, but essentially, it is a World of Warcraft type game. And again, we're trying to, you know, those artists are looking for unique sounds to add their own style to it. Hit sounds are uh, over the top big. This is really easy when you come into sound design for video games. You want everything to be big. You are, every sound needs to be like the greatest, hugest, most amazing sound. But the trouble is, in video games, as you know, sounds are being triggered so fast and they're stacking on top of each other. You have like 260 sounds playing on top. If they're all big, your mix is just completely blown out. So uh, you have to you know, do things like, uh, just as you have a, like, I don't know if any of you guys have like a, one of the drumming programs where if you hit the snare at a lighter velocity, it's playing a completely different sample versus if you're just smacking that thing as hard as you can, it's playing a different sample. You can do that in video games. You can have hit sounds that are based on velocity, and there are certain brackets that if you, the player is hitting you from two feet away versus running half a field and then laying you out, it'll play a, a completely different sample for you. Acoustics don't apply no matter what the room size is. This used to actually be a hardware limitation that you know we just didn't have the, the real-time reverbs and whatnot that we have available now. Um, but we're, kind of, we're starting to do all kinds of stuff with audio where audio can reflect off the surfaces and you know you can get a different effect if it's you know in a room that would be procedurally or perceived as carpeted or uh, acoustically treated versus being outside, that kind of stuff. Uh, epic music must all sound like John Williams or Hans Zimmer. <laughs> 
this one I always point out, uh, anybody see Tron? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so Daft Punk did the soundtrack to Tron. Uh, one of my favorite recent scores in cinema, actually went out and bought that. Um, and I liked it because, first off, it didn't try to be, you know, the typical epic music that you heard in other movies. It had traces of it, but it certainly had Daft Punk's signature in it. Um, I think that that's critical if you're, you know, trying to work on a, a gaming franchise. So many of them have already had a history. Um, so you try to blend in whatever you're doing and pull in some element. And Tron, they're pulling in that whole electronica world kind of element into it. Um, so keep that in mind if you're, you know, doing any kind of major composition for a game. Back at dynamic range. Mm -hmm. This one it hasn't been called out in the press quite a bit, but uh, it certainly is something we talk about all the time. Uh, you notice this in the music industry a lot, uh, where you know albums from the 1970s or whatnot had a pretty good amount of dynamic range. And nowadays, you you import one of those on the SoundForge, everything looks like a brick. Um, why that's crazy? Let's end this next slide here, and that is. Um, let me get the not as firing one. Uh, audio levels for broadcast average minus 20 dB with peaks at 10 dB. That's why when you're watching a movie, you know, you have some dialogue, and there's a car chase, and there's a big explosion, and it seems like that's a huge event because of the dynamic range that has occurred. You play a lot of games, uh, you know, you'll notice that that's not really going on that much. It's, you know, you say you got the guy loading the gun, it sounds as loud as firing it, bombs sound the same as the gunshots, cars sound the same as, you know, jets, uh, and this is the reason why right here. High levels for many video games average 0 dB with peaks at 0 dB. 0 dB is as loud as you can possibly make the console without it turning audio off. So, um, We've been, you know, trying different experiments with this. Uh, matter of fact, our initial release of NCAA, we released a broadcast spec mix, and we waited and watched. In Operation Sports, sure enough, there comes the thread. What's up with audio on NCAA? And I had to turn my amp up to like minus 30. And we were cracking up here like, oh, man, you know, it's the dynamic range thing. And we actually did tweak the, the mix a little bit um, to bring it up a little louder, but we still kind of stuck to our guns on that. And because of that, we have also gotten a lot of feedback that the game does seem very real. It has that, you know, the crowd seems like it breathes a little. There are quiet moments in the game, and then there's insane moments in the game when you're down yeah, against the violent or something. Uh, so this is something also, unlike the film and broadcast industry, there is no uh, regulation to allow you to make a video game currently from any of the manufacturers. They're just, you know, they're looking for skipping or any of those kinds of things. But yeah, no, no regulations there. <coughs> yeah. just, as a, just as a side note, I probably didn't hear as much of it as you did, obviously, but I heard nothing but extra praise about the sound of NCAA in particular. Yeah, it, uh, uh, it was that, really good feedback. We had two software engineers working strictly on audio for NCAA. We, it was the first year we started doing heavy contracting for recording, which we can actually thank Chris, who was one of the teams that uh, we went. We were the, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, UFLSU? Yeah. Yeah. Like that it. was a game we pulled nice. a ton of stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, it was an awesome game. Yeah. And that happened. I actually recently was up at the Michigan State game that uh, they won. It, it was a rivalry that had been going on for seven years. Uh, and they finally. Uh, beat the, the Buckeyes and then you know we had 24 mics out on the field and uh, all the stand, all the fans rushed the field and all the we saw all of our mics that were like <laughs> <laughs> great game though and I remember telling the ESPN guy he was a Buckeyes he's like oh, yeah we're gonna get him I go you know just for sound's sake I hope they win this because they're gonna go crazy so there could be no such thing as a big sound without a small one for reference you know, that is something that's kind of just a fundamental in the audience. If you want to build up to big moments, you got to learn how to be conservative on the other end. Um, and that's a hard thing to do after the gate. But uh, help your dynamic range. Uh, bad sample source. This one has gotten so much better over the years. Uh, when I first got into the industry, it was kind of like, what? Go record an actual 
car or for a car game. What? <laughs> uh, getting the right sample source can make or break a great sounding game. You, you know, you got to start with something, right? And if you start with uh, an accurate source, uh, you can start to dice it and manipulate it and turn apart and understand what you're getting into. Uh, if you want a specific sound, a real deal whenever possible. And that's uh, not always easy. Uh, you know, things like we want to go get uh, crowds for the uh, NFL. And the NFL owns all rights to everything shot in their uh, stadiums. So you have to get their clearance to actually walk into the door. Uh, and that's okay. You know, you can pay for that every now and then. Um, but you got to look at how big is the sound design project, right? So you got to say, what can we get for banging for the buck? And like in college, they're totally cool with us recording. So we can go out and record every college game. And we can pull from that source and cross pollinate into other franchises. We did with Blitz and whatnot. We used a lot of NCAA stuff. Um, just because it's readily available. Short on staff contract for remote recordings. <coughs> this used to be, you know, let's just send a guy here locally. See if you can go to, you know, if you're recording a car thing, go to a car meet or something like that. See if you can get somebody to do something funny. Um, you know, we found that, well, there might be you know, a company out in like Texas building supercars or whatnot. Um, we don't want to fly our whole staff out there, so we'll hire somebody who's an expert at that need for speed. Hire a guy named John Pesso, who uh, is, if you IMDB this guy, you're going to be like, that's like every building, man. I mean, it's just this mile long resume. He is like a recording expert of cars, some stuff like uh, I Am Legend and Pearl Harbor and all these other kinds of stuff. Uh, you fly him out there with his, you know, amazing equipment, and uh, he records everything for us, and then we send it back. And you have this just pristine source; everything's five one, um, you know, ninety six K, twenty four bit. You can manipulate that. Forever. It's great, and it's really not that much more expensive than if you were trying to you know, fly your own staff out there. Make more than one iteration of this game, and I think that this is a key investment in audio for the long haul. So that's something when I mean, you're on a franchise type game, <coughs> you hear that there's a lack in one aspect. You know, your hit sounds aren't that great, your crowd sounds aren't that great. We're going to take one year and we're just going to try to, you know, get as much data as we possibly can. All right, music is just filler. And I, you know, music is so underrated as far as what it brings to the game and film and uh, games. Music is the emotion of your game. We kind of beat that into producers' heads quite a bit, and that's because, uh, you know, like when you're playing through a franchise or you're playing Fight Night or something like that, you know, not everybody likes a boxing game or a sports game, but everybody likes the really good, you know, movie about the underdog who triumphs on the end or whatever. A lot of that is just built on emotion because you get attached to that character, you're feeling what they're feeling. Um, those are the things that you can bring out through music. You get a great script under uh, your musical score, and you know you got dialogue and music playing on each other. You're going to have a good game, just based on building a story, creating an emotion. You get people pulled in. It's, it's awesome. The best results always use genre appropriate styles. If you're making Prince of Persia, probably not the heavy metal section. They tried that. So, uh, there's a, I remember playing Kingdom of the Fire, that was back in the Xbox days, and we were all excited about it because graphically it looked great. Um, both dialogue and music were just so 180 from where they needed to be, and it just killed the game. And, you know, big flop because of that. Uh, licensing is not always cheaper than a composer. That's a misconception. Now, I'm not just talking about licensing from uh, an A-list. Uh, talent. I'm talking about licensing from you know one of the stock houses, essentially. You know, uh, different. That might have you know a couple thousand pieces of music or whatever. Um, recently, we did this on Blitz. We actually uh, we wanted to have like a really aggressive kind of soundtrack that was somewhat metal in some places, and other places it was kind of this crazy dubstep or whatever. We pulled a former Full Sail uh, guy named Josh Munn who had climbed to the number two part, our number two point on the uh, uh, Beatport Top 100 was right under Scrolls. Like, that guy's an Orlando guy, you know. Uh, called him in, hey, would you like to do a lot of work on this game for us? 
Um, it was a great deal for us. It was a great deal for him too, because he was, you know, just up and coming. Um, and we felt like we really had the edge of, you know, having something unique for a game and a style that is just kind of hitting the mainstream in a big way. Hollywood composers are not always the right choice for a game. You know, it would be cool if you could get Hans Zimmer to do your big epic game, but the deal is, is he's doing multiple films, usually, and what would happen is, even if you could pay the fees to hire a composer of that caliber, you're probably going to get uh, one of his underwriters to write the majority of the music and he's going to, you know, do whatever. But you're also not going to get as much bang for the buck. If I said I got $50,000 if you can compose, uh, let's say 45 minutes to an hour of music from the game, I mentioned there's somebody in this facility that could knock it out of the park. And it would be a score that would be on par or greater than even a Hollywood composer because number one, they'd be so thrilled to actually, you know, yeah, I can you know, hit a major franchise with a score, they're gonna put a lot of time and resources and care and they're gonna follow up consistently. We've done that with uh, Colin O'Malley, who uh, does a lot of the composition for NCAA. Uh, we worked with him on Superman, it was the same thing. You know, we did, you know, introduced him to that, he did a knockout job on there, we got him for NCAA. Every year he's just been you know, a monster on that title. And it sounds totally authentic to what we're trying to achieve, a very you know, college-esque type sound. Be wary of popular music of today. It may not be popular by the time you're getting on a okay, project cycle. Now, for us, it's not that bad. Sometimes it's six months, eight months. Um, but some games, you know, two years, four years. So if you're going down the road of we're going to be using this piece of music and this artist is being heard right now, uh, people will have heard those songs to death by the time your game comes out. And then they put their game in, oh, this is a great new game. And, ah, Man, I'm sick of that song, you know. Um, our big LA label, the A Tracks, they try to really be very interesting. They um, essentially look for artists who are going to be breaking at about the moment that the game is going to be marketing. You know, who's in the studio now? What are they doing now? What are they planning for, uh, you know, in the March or May time frame? Uh, they'll be listening to rough versions of the mix and tracks. And then all that like major licensed music comes in very, very late in the cycle, usually days or weeks of you know, our beta time, and then it goes into the game. Uh, and that's cool, because then by the time the game comes out, that is fresh music, or it has only been on the market for you know, a very little amount of time. Uh, the other thing is uh, a lot of people dismiss uh, the attachment fans can get to a piece of music that's in the game. Um, this could actually escalate your franchise or your game to, you know, a pop culture kind of status. Uh, and the one game that I can think of that is just absolutely not get out of the park on this. Let's
was put together by one of our software engineers in the Stupid Calgary. Um, and we were really, you know, I mean, it is true. Portal was just like a little supplemental to the orange box title. You know, they were really pushing Half Life at that time. But it became a phenomenon, and of course, led to its sequel, which is pretty outstanding. So the number one mistake in the video game is bad dialogue. Uh, we've seen this uh, very first thing you'll ever read about audio in a video game is what they thought of the commentary. And nothing will kill your audio score like this. Uh, whether it's, you know, <laughs> uh, you have a, you know, somebody in Madden that they're like, eh, it doesn't sound like it really does in life, sounds monotone, sounds robotic, you know, whatever. You get slammed harder, and you can have this incredible sound design behind it. Uh, so contract with professional <coughs> and you're doing your dialogue, that's another thing. Um, a lot of teams all just make some stuff up. What do you say, you know, or just pull some lines from TV. It's really helps if you, you know, find a uh, somebody who knows whatever it is that you're doing. You know, if it's a, you're doing a science fiction game, hire a sci-fi writer. Hire somebody that's like known for that. Um, and they're going to get compelling dialogue if you're doing sports stuff. Try to find people who are actually announcing for sports to help you with, you know, writing the script or contract them to help you write the script. Uh, you go a long way. Uh, do a cast a call as if for film if you're hiring you know, non-major talent um, and you're looking for specific voices. You know, have an open cast call just like you would for any film and bring them in and hear the different voices. We did this for the MA and uh, we found some great voices that way. You know, you might sit like a, a week in the studio with hundreds of people coming in and you're like, another one of these? And some of them are really fun. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you do find your, your few people that are just total ringers for it. Um, hire actors, not basic voice talent, as I went over earlier. Uh, if it possible, record as if on location. This not only uh, will give you a better performance, but it also gets the actor way more engaged. If they're just standing behind two sheets of glass and they got the stand and the monitor and a microphone, they're going to get kind of mundane after you know 20, 30, 150 pages of dialogue. They're just going to be like, oh, okay. But if they're actually moving around the sound stage and acting out the part, acting like they're saying things, showing the visuals, they're going to be way more energized and recorded. I always use the same microphone for each actor for the entire project. Nothing worse than having stitched lines. And this was recorded on a you know U87. This was recorded on you know some broadcast mic or something. And it stitches between those two lines. We're like, who's the third guy that just entered the loop? <laughs> So that's a, one of those, you know, continuity kind of thing. Uh, record the scenario, not the script, when possible. This is another thing that we really started doing a couple of years ago, and that's where, you know, a talent would come in, and they'd read the script, and they might not really say it that way in uh, real life. And I know Madden himself was a big advocate of this. We'd just say, okay, that's the scenario we're trying to get across. You know, it's uh, fourth and goal. This team's been down. If they really make this, this is a, a game changing event. What would you say here? And then have them look at the line and either improv on that line or deliver something that is totally unique. Uh, again, you'll get a far more realistic result. So you don't even need a big script. A lot of teams are now starting to break it down to they only have like two example lines and the scenario listed. Uh, record plenty of variations of generic and often played lines. You know, the last thing a person wants to hear is that same line of dialogue hit them over and over and over again. Your average player is in the game 40 hours. So that's, uh, that's something that's a mandatory thing. You know, if you have that bucket of these are the, you know, sort of outpost guard guy or whatever, and you walk up to him, every time he talks, you should say something different, or at least try to have him say something different. <laughs> All right, uh, set up a logic system for speech playback on simple events. This is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, don't just call everything that they see. You know, try to have something like there's a result of it. And that doesn't even need to just be speech, you know. It could be like an award game. It's like a big bomb goes off, all the ambience dies down, like all the animals will ran away or something like that. Uh, you want people to notice those kinds of details. The things are constantly changing. Them. Keep them engaged in what you're doing. All right, I know that was a really long presentation, so I am going to open up the floor for any questions that you have about anything.